Good to see each one this evening. We want each one to feel welcome. We would remind you of the question period that will follow when we finish and are dismissed this evening. So if you have things you have questions about as we proceed, just make some notes and be ready to answer or to ask. We're talking this evening about the rocks. And if I can get this to advance, for some reason it, okay, maybe. Geologists like to talk about rocks and dinosaurs, and so we're going to have fun this evening talking about some, I think, very interesting things. The evolutionist says that the rocks talk about evolution. Uh, I think there's an alternative explanation that works better than theirs, and hopefully that will become obvious. We're not talking about all of the rocks. We're talking about sedimentary rocks. Geologists know what that is, but maybe you do. It's Sedimentary rocks are rocks that were laid down by water. You see the horizontal layers as you drive along with the road cuts. Uh, here on Earth, you see layers with billions and billions of dead things in them laid down by water all over the world. Well, I think to Christians, there should come to mind a very obvious explanation for that. Uh, but rocks laid down by water with billions and billions of dead things in it uh, ought to talk to us about our faith. Uh, covers the continents to an average of about a mile and a half. Uh, not everywhere, but and sometimes more than a mile and a half, but an average over all of the continents. We see sedimentary layers like this that are horizontal layers stacked on top of each other. Uh, I think most of them were caused by the flood. And it's amazing that geologists will acknowledge that if they're not uh, implying maybe there was a flood. These sedimentary rocks are on Mars, and we're told in Discover that this is an indication of a catastrophic flood rapidly carved the surface of Mars. Well, we see the same thing on Earth, and they won't allow that. They see it up there where there's virtually no water, as opposed to the earth with 70% of the surface covered with oceans, an average of three miles deep. No, it's not a flood. It's a slow, gradual evolution. But here in nature, uh, in 2020, they talk about, <laughs> of all things, the Noachan stratigraphic record on Mars. That's the name they gave these layers, this particular section on Mars, but they would never do that here on Earth. I think when you see rocks all over the world laid down by water with billions of dead things in it, you've got pretty good evidence. Now, they explain it as a slow, gradual process over millions of years that record evolution. I think there is an alternative explanation that works better, and that's a rapid, catastrophic, high-energy uh, catastrophe, a series of catastrophes that had occurred about 4,500 years ago. Billions and billions of dead things and rocks laid down by water all over the world. How do you explain that? Well, there are two different views. I think we can show the advantage of one, and that will be the thesis of our lesson this evening. The evolutionary model is stacked together and represented in the textbooks like this, and that's supposed to represent gradual process through time of evolving from the com simple to the more complex. The only place you find this in its complete form like this is in the textbooks. You can't dig down in the earth and find this complete picture anywhere. It has to be pieced together by what's called correlation. And here from Leighton Judson, Physical Geology, 
was taught from at two different state universities, we're told because we cannot find sedimentary rocks representing all of Earth time neatly in one convenient area, which is what's supposed to be represented in that column we just looked at, and that's what you see in the textbook. You can't find that in any one spot. You have to piece it together from place to place. Some of it's in China, and some in Canada, and some uh, in Texas. And that's pieced together by correlation. The process of tying it together uh, is known as correlated correlation. Uh, the result, as acknowledged here in the Encyclopedia Britannica, is a mental abstraction, not concrete, if you please, uh, but a mental abstraction that's pieced together that is the geologic column. But that's not the way it's presented in the textbooks. It's, that's what you're supposed to see when you dig down, and that's not what you see. In fact, David Rapp, one of the leading authorities in the world. He's curator, dean of science, the Field Museum of Natural History, the largest fossil museum in the United States. Um, and he says, in the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable regressions, which is what's represented in the column. Uh, in general, these have not been found Yet the optimism dies hard and pure fantasy has crept into the textbooks. That sounds like something I would say, but that's what David Rapp said and probably the leading authority in the United States. When we look at this column, which is presented as what you dig, find when you dig down on the earth, you're seeing a very skewed picture for a number of reasons. As indicated here in the, the graphics, you've got mainly vertebrates, animals with backbones, uh, pretty good sized ones. That's not what you see generally in the fossil record. It's not mostly vertebrates, it's mostly marine invertebrates. Well, why isn't it represented that way? Well, they don't want it to look like a flood deposit. Uh, but the fossil record is 95% marine animals without backbones. About 5% is left. 4.5% are plants and algae. Where do you get the vertebrates, the ones you see represented in the column? That's about 1 one-hundredth of 1% 1 of the entire record are vertebrates, and those, that's mostly fish. That's not what you see in the picture in the textbooks. I think we're looking at a flood deposit, and that's what all of the founders of the discipline of geology believed. But as philosophy changed and they determined to become more sophisticated and um, atheist, uh, that became denied. I don't think it was a, the physical evidence. It was philosophical necessity for someone who denies God. The book, The Genesis Flood, was published in 61 uh, and really started the creation movement, as it's referred to here in the United States. It took the evidence from geology and explained it in terms of the Genesis Flood. And many will think, well, it would just jumble everything everything together, it wouldn't look like what we see, and they refuted that. And the fellow who wrote the forward, who is an evolutionary geologist, an atheist, nevertheless acknowledged that the facts of geology do fit this interpretation, and that they have built a strong case for it. Uh, and if you want to see how that works, you can read the book. Actually, there's an updated version. Uh, that was 61. Now then, just a few years ago, son of Henry Morris, the author of the first book, one of the authors, has published an upgraded version, and now then we know more about plate tectonics and some things they didn't know about in 61. And that's all incorporated and I think made a stronger picture. 
but even the atheist will acknowledge, yes, it fits. And if that doesn't seem quite right, you can get the book. That's another subject. But when we're looking at this column, we're looking at a skewed conceptual correlation that's useless as proof of evolution because it assumes the thing to be proved to start with. When, when, how do you correlate things together? Well, if you're an evolutionist, the things that are simple go at the bottom. The things more complex go at the top. That's the way you stack it together. You have to have that assumption in order to build it, which they will acknowledge if you usually get into graduate work some circular logic involved. I think it is useful, however, as a model which will allow us to test the concept of evolution. If evolution is true, then there are certain things we should expect to see like this that would fit this picture. There are certain things that would contradict this picture. And so I think it is useful as a model, and that's the way we'll proceed. I think it provides a test for the evolutionary explanation. And we'll allow Stephen Stanley, one of the more famous geologists in our country from Johns Hopkins, to explain what that means. He refers to topsy-turvy fossils. Here is the order that shows how it ought to be. And if you find things that should be at the bottom at the top, or things that should be at the top at the bottom, then that's the topsy-turvy problem that would test the concept. He says, if you find the topsy-turvy fossils, it would disprove evolution. Any topsy-turvy sequence of fossils would force us to rethink our theory. Uh, <laughs> well, that's the way it would should work. Uh, but... That's not always the way. But anyway, that's the concept. The topsy-turvy fossils. Here are things supposed to be down. You don't find them up, but when you do, you have a refutation or at least a negative implication. This we find rather commonly. It's not that much of an exception to find things that are supposed to be down up. Uh, it's the other way that they normally look at. Uh, but this is not uncommon. For example, uh, we have out in the foyer in some of the exhibits uh, a horseshoe crab. And this, this is a description here, 2021, in Nature that says this is uh, the oldest of these are 450 million years ago. That's right down at the bottom of the geologic column. About 500 years, a little more. 450, that's just pretty close to the bottom. But they're unchanged and they're still running around all over the place. And the ones that we see out here, we've got one supposed to be 135 million and the one on top of it was running around last year. You can see that out front, and they're identical. Now, according to what you read in the geology textbooks, they started 450 million years ago down at the bottom, and then about 50 million years ago, they all disappeared, or at least that's the implication when you don't see it higher in the column. 50 million years without them, extinct, right? No, <laughs> there they are all over the place, and so it falsifies the extinction hypothesis. Here is a, what we'll call a topsy fossil, and it shows the fact that it disappears in the column for 50 million years. It doesn't mean it's extinct. There, and there are just lots of examples of that. Another would be the coelacanth, which is a fish that you do find often with the dinosaurs that's supposed to have gone extinct about that time. Keith Thompson, president of the Academy of Natural Sciences, says we have no fossil coelacanths younger than the late Cretaceous. Now, the late Cretaceous, that's toward the middle. That's when the dinosaurs went extinct. They're gone. 
just like the dinosaurs, 400, uh, over 100 million years ago, uh, and we have none younger than that. You get above that, there are no fossils, but we have caught over a thousand of them in the last few decades when they were first discovered back in the late uh, 30s, early 40s. Um, falsified the concept uh, of extinction by many examples of something that's supposed to have been gone since the dinosaurs. Uh, wouldn't surprise me if we found some of those, but that hasn't happened, or at least not documented yet. Uh, now, the thing, though, that they really bow their back ah, and refuse to acknowledge is things that are supposed to be up that are found down. Things down, up, yeah, we find the things that are supposed to be at the beginning up, lots of them. But you couldn't possibly find things that hadn't evolved yet down at the bottom before they evolved. That would just really rip it, wouldn't it? That's, the other is a negative mark. This is a complete falsification. We'll call that the Turvey fossil. And we have found a number of those, and we'll be looking at several of those for the rest of the session this evening. But notice the implication, as acknowledged by Richard Dawkins, uh, that Pope of Evolution that we listened to last night. He said, we should be very surprised, for example, to find fossil humans appearing in the record before mammals are supposed to have evolved. <laughs> very surprised would be an understatement. That would refute it. That would be the turvy fossil. He says the whole modern theory of evolution would be utterly destroyed. So here's a test of the proposition. In Newsweek, he made an even stronger statement. He said evolution could be so easily disproved if just a single fossil turned up in the wrong date order. And we'll show you some examples of that. What would be evidence against evolution, very strong evidence at that, would be the discovery of a single fossil in the wrong geological stratum. Well, that's why I think the geologic column can be useful as a model. Let's test, let's see if things work. Here is an example of exactly what he was talking about. These are human fossils that are found in the same layer where you find dinosaurs, supposed to be 100 million years apart. This is definitely in the wrong date order. Uh, Dinosaur National Monument is where you find an awful lot of dinosaurs, hundreds of them. Part of the, the layers there, many of them are the Dakota sandstone, which is what we just looked at with the human fossils in it down near Moab, Utah. Supposedly, over 100 million years old, uh, with the dinosaurs, same layer you find at Dinosaur National Monument, and there were 11 individuals buried together. Well, that would destroy it, but you have to come up with explanations to explain it away, and they are rather inventive. This must have been an intrusional burial. It's not where it was originally buried. It uh, got unburied and then buried again. It would have to, or it fell down a crack in the rock, or it was in a mine cave-in. So it's not where it looks like it is. Uh, there's no indication of a crack or a cave. or Half of them are female. One of them is an infant. There are no broken bones. It doesn't look like a mine cave in, does it? No indication that, but you have to have that kind of explanation, or the whole theory of evolution collapses. We went to that site, which is just below Moab, near LaSalle, Utah, and it's an open pit copper mine. The road that you see in the foreground wasn't there back in the 40s. They cut down through here. And now about halfway down, about 50 feet, 
in this Dakota sandstone, you find the human fossils. 50 feet down in the Dakota sandstone is what you find at Dinosaur National Monument. No indication of a cave or a mine cave in. Now, these uh, are somewhat articulated, that is, as together in life. These are not. They're just bunched together. They may look like they go together, but they're just a pile of bones. The one I'm holding in my hand is one I just took out of the rock, washed off with a canteen, and there it is. And <laughs> It's a perfectly modern, unbroken uh, femur, and... Uh, exactly what he said would destroy evolution, but, you know, it fell down a crack, I guess. So you can't find the crack. I think it's a powerful example. We do find that they are replaced, they're bright green, replaced with malachite, which would clearly indicate this is not a recent burial. It would take roughly a thousand years for that. There is zero collagen. It takes a while for the collagen to dissipate about a thousand years at least. Um, if you want to know if you've got a modern bone or a fossil, uh, just put a match to the end of it. If it stinks, it's got collagen in it. <laughs> Quick and I just throw that in extra. <laughs> Quick and dirty test if you want to know. Uh, some of them are obviously replaced. Here's turquoise teeth, jewelry grade turquoise. Uh, so this is definitely a turvy fossil according to this Pope of Evolution, Richard Dawkins. Evolution would be destroyed, disproved, unless, of course, it was a mine cave in or somehow intrusionally buried, which they have to assume without evidence. When we go to Glen Rose, Texas, Dinosaur Valley State Park, we see evidence, though, that's not subject to intrusional burial. You have some really neat-looking dinosaur tracks. Uh, well, wouldn't bones be better than tracks? Well, bones can be eroded and redeposited. We have an indication. You shouldn't assume that unless you have evidence, but uh, you can't do that with tracks. They are where they're at. You erode them, they're gone. And so we know they are where they were made. And so it really becomes resistant then to these arbitrary explanations to explain the evidence away. Here we see a picture that was taken back in the 40s of some really neat looking dinosaur tracks discovered by Roland T. Bird, or at least made popular uh, in uh, American uh, scientists. Some of them, in addition to the dinosaur tracks, look like this. And I don't think I have to tell you what that looks like. But that has to be carved or just happens to be erosion, according to them. Stan Taylor decided to test that hypothesis. There were two of them coming out from under the riverbank. Let's go back up under the riverbank, removing about six feet of alternating clay and limestone, clay and limestone, and see if those tracks continue under the layers. If they do, what would that say about the idea they've been carved? That would pretty well rip it, wouldn't it? Uh, there were 12 more that he found back up under the riverbank in a right-left, right-left pattern. Uh, some of them pretty obvious. You see the mud push up around it, about 11 inches in size. Um, that's not carved. It's under the overburden, which was just removed. Uh, not erosion. Here's the outline around it indicating mud push-up, that's, that's pretty good evidence. Uh, now, as we examine this, though, some new things began to appear. There was a film made showing footprints in stone, and all we were seeing were the human footprints. And then we got to see these other 
things that look bigger and well maybe these are giant humans so I thought well I didn't buy that but as we continued to study over a period of years we found these had claws these were dinosaur tracks and then some said well see you just misinterpreted it it was a dinosaur track all along and we weren't sure what the case was for a while we withdrew the film and then uh, I stopped using the argument until we spent probably three or four more years studying. This is the track that really I think brought things into focus and you have to look at it for a minute to get the detail. You've got both in one spot. Here's the dinosaur track that's about 25 inches long shape like very obvious dinosaur track but then stepping in it and sometimes it's across and sometimes beside but here within you see the human footprint uh, here you can see it untouched They're all five toes and instep and heel back that up there's the clear human footprint right in the middle of the dinosaur track. Uh, this is the way it looked after I'd made a presentation in a science meeting up in Tennessee and the fellow who had uh, made his reputation trying to explain these footprints, Humanist of the Year Award, heard the lecture and the next day was on the plane and in the river with an iron bar and just beat the living daylights out of it. We've got four witnesses to that, so that track is beat up pretty bad, though we do have good stereo photographs and casts uh, as well documented. Further ahead in the same trail, you see this, and the dinosaur tracks seem to be depressed but filled in, infill material, sometimes even raised as the other material erodes away from it but the human tracks are depressed, stepped in, sometimes in the infill. Looking at a side view of this one, you can see those three toes to the right, the anterior portion of the dinosaur track, and then there's the 11 inch footprint, human footprint, you put a human foot in it, and wow, you can feel that molded shape and I don't think you're going to convince that person that they're 100 million years apart if they're stepping in each other's footprints. And if they're not, then that geologic column doesn't work. On further up the trail, you see this one. Now, let me back that up. This is right or left. we got a right. And the next one is a left. And it's right, left, right, left for 14 consistently. Uh, that one, now let me back that up a minute. Here, when it was first uncovered, you can't really see anything but the human footprint. But something's going on over there to the right. You can't really tell until the next year, a little more erosion revealed, yep, there is a dinosaur track right beside it, about 25 inches, but completely outside. Sometimes they're across, sometimes within, and sometimes beside. There's 134 dinosaur tracks on this platform that weren't seen when the film was made. But with more erosion and about 12 years later, we could count 130. But right through the middle, comes other tracks that are very, very different. Uh, not at all like the dinosaur tracks. Here, 14, and a right-left pattern, another sequence of 15, we'll show you in a minute. Uh, that's powerful evidence. It's not er eroded. Uh, it answers objections. Uh, you know, how did, sometimes you see funny looking things in rocks, the old man in the mountain, but you see four old men in the mountain. That's not erosion, is it? You might get one, but you don't get two. This is really good evidence. I 
perfect turvy fossil. It's not uh, intrusional, you can't do that with tracks. Not carved, it was excavated from under the overburden. Not erosion, right, left, right, left, with the mud push up around it. That's, that's just exactly what you need to do what Dawkins said it would do if you found it. Uh, I presented this at uh, a session in uh, with about 50 grad students and the head of the department, geology department, University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Uh, one of the students had heard about it, wanted to see what the department head said, and finished the presentation. All the students turned around to the department head, what, you, what are you going to say? Uh, and he thought a minute, he said, well, we don't know that there weren't dinosaurs back there with human feet. I'm not making that up, and that's exactly what he said. And I thought, well, I guess that's right. We don't know that. We also don't know that there weren't humans back there with dinosaur feet, too. Wouldn't that make about as much sense? Wouldn't it be more reasonable to say these things that look like dinosaur feet were made by dinosaurs, these things look like human feet were made by humans? No, he wouldn't agree. I said, well, if they were human tracks, would they look any different? And he got up and left. Uh, and there were several geology students that became creationists, which is what's happened when we presented this across the country. We had uh, the head of the Museum of Natural History in Dallas, Chuck, excuse me, Chuck Finsley, who'd been director of that museum for 30 years who was interested in one of the dinosaurs we'd excavated and uh, came down to our museum there in Glen Rose, and uh, we made him look at the footprints while he was there. <laughs> he got upset and left. And then a couple of weeks later, he came back. He really wanted that dinosaur that we display. And he had to look at the footprints again. He got more upset and then left again. And the third time he came down, he said, Dr. Patton, I've got the answer. I can tell you what these footprints look like humans. Uh, are, I, I can explain that. He says, I think those tracks were made by aliens. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, Chuck, if they were made by aliens, they'd come from a galaxy far, far away. They'd probably be more advanced than we are some kind of fancy space suit on. What are they doing running around barefooted? <laughs> he got mad and left again. But sometimes it's just really fun to be a creationist. You know, you, maybe it's what it looks like. This is the way science is supposed to work. You don't have to twist and turn and talk about dinosaurs with human feet or aliens. You just Go with the, what it's, what's there in front of your face, what it looks like. If, as long as you're going to dream up things, you might as well dream up an alien dinosaur with human footprints. But I don't think that has anything to do with science. Uh, I think we just need to go with the facts, and that's the way creationists are doing it. They said, well, you need more evidence, and so we started following the dinosaur trail back down uh, and... There was a drought that year, and uh, it continued. We excavated the longest continuous dinosaur trail on the American continent, 154 consecutive dinosaur tracks, uh, over 500 feet long, uh, some of them just absolutely spectacular. We know what dinosaur tracks look like, some of them with the obvious paws, and there are plenty of them there, and people who say, well, they were just human tracks, they, that was wrong. And that's, of course, the implication of the film, and they had to withdraw that. That's, that's wrong. There are lots of dinosaur tracks there, 134 on the platform, and then this long trail. Uh, well, maybe you need more evidence. Maybe there's some evidence up ahead. So that platform ahead of the fellow standing at the end of the trail, 
uh, was a couple of layers up from the print layer, and so we excavated down to it, and sure enough, there's another trail. Dinosaur tracks in on the side, but right down the middle is 15 this time uh, in a right-left pattern. Here are two of them, uh, two dinosaur tracks side by side, and this is a different type dinosaur. The highlighting here shows the duck-type foot of uh, a hadrosaur, duck-billed dinosaur, but something stepped in the one on the right. Uh, you see it highlighted here. Now the one on the left is just like the one on the right without the footprint. Uh, when you look at a close-up, you see, yeah, there's that duck-shaped foot for the hadrosaur, but look what's stepping in the back of it. Uh, when you look at it closely, you can actually see the joints in the knuckles. That's just perfect. And it's in a sequence of 15 in a right-left pattern. Uh, with my beloved standing here at the end of the trail, she never did get used to mopping the bottom of the river, but she, she was a big help. And I mean, just very seriously. This track had been found uh, several years earlier. Uh, it was just too good to be true. It carved, maybe, and kind of it was broad at the front. And we did some experiments with concrete, walking, making tracks, walking tracks, running tracks. When you run, you press down with the front part of your foot, and you make a track that looks like this. And we reproduced that precisely. This is a running track. But it, are we, we sure somebody didn't just make that? Well, we sectioned across it, and sometimes under, within the rock, under the track, you can see indications of whether it's carved or not. This is a section across the heel that would be displaced, and look right under the heel, that's disturbed material that would not be the case if it were carved. Well, they said it must be a real dinosaur track somebody carved toes on when I presented that at a science meeting. So we sectioned across the toes and found some very interesting things. Actually, there's structures under each of the toes, but especially at the great toe, looking here at a close-up, you can see the following contours, and that says, nope, it's not carved. This is original impression in the sediment. So it was ver <clears throat> verified both heel and toe scientifically, and they quit saying you need more evidence at that point. Then this one was found. Uh, now that one just has to be too good to be true. Here is dinosaur track, human track. Uh, when this was first found, the fellow only saw the dinosaur track, put it under his bed and left it there for a couple of years. And two years later, got it out and was cleaning it up. Oh, there's a human track there with it. Well, is this possibly carved? We didn't want to saw it. This was so perfect. Uh, and so we took it to the hospital and we gave it a CAT scan. Uh, a spiral CT scan. This is a cross, a virtual cross section, and you're able to see underneath. Now, there's the line that is represented by the cross section, but notice where the the dinosaur track is, corresponding to the track below where the white line goes across. And then you see the little dip on the left where the big toe was, and where that line goes across it. But look directly under that great toe, you see again the following contours where the toe displaced the sediment. This one likewise is verified. That's not carved. That's original impression in the sediment. And so evidence just continues to pile up. About this time we are in Arkansas and 
we hear about some tracks that are 300 miles away and excavating, yep, same critters, exactly the same rock verified as, quote, Glenrose limestone by the University of Arkansas. Uh, and here's some of the teenagers that helped us excavate that. We have the three-toed and the sauropods, as we do at Glen Rose. Now, that kind of a layer is supposed to be, according to the geologists, something that's laid down maybe by a local flood, 300 miles apart, exactly the same stuff and the same critters. Uh, I think that's interesting. Around the world, you find all kinds of evidence like this of humans and dinosaurs together. This is out west, the Four Corners area near Blanding, Utah, and the Anasazi Indians lived there and they carved uh, various things in the rocks. Uh, this is a beautiful picture of the, the red, well, it's not red limestone, it's actually more tan, but the red is the desert varnish that normally takes about a thousand years to form, and when you scratch through it, you leave markings, which they were doing. You can see snakes and shaman and various things they're representing, but notice, can you see, let's see if I can get that, to, let me back that up. Yeah, you can see the dinosaur that they have uh, drawn together with the men and the snakes. And this is some 1,200 years ago, that, and we know of at least four examples of that in the rock art uh, in that part of the country. We traveled to Peru uh, down in the Nazca area, and this is Dr. Javier Cabrera, who was one of the more famous scientists in Peru, he performed the first heart, heart transplant there. Uh, he was a, a surgeon, uh, formed three teaching hospitals, and then retired to be cultural anthropologist down in Nazca. His father had collected burial stones from the Inca tombs that had carvings on them, and he had a collection of several thousand. I was there, he had a total of 11,000, many of which he had collected. And we were able to excavate in some of these tombs. Uh, cruel culture, the mother dies, you bury the baby with her. Uh, and we saw that several times. But also you find these stones that you can see here in place. And they carve scenes on those stones and here is one of the scenes that they carved. They were carving, down, about a third of them have dinosaurs carved on them from uh, about 1,500 years ago, at least. Uh, to, 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 they're dated from 1,500 to 2,500. Here you see the dermal frills on the back of the Diplodocus type. When Mr. Sinclair made his dinosaur, you didn't know about those dermal frills, uh, but they did maybe 2,500 years ago down in Peru when they were carving pictures. He has thousands of these that he's collected. Uh, shades of Jurassic Park here. Uh, the man with the foot in the mouth being eaten in conflict. Uh, no question really about what's being represented. You have a wide variety. I took one of the art professors from the University of Texas at Arlington with me. He said there were at least a hundred different artists represented with different materials, different styles. Uh, this is one in my collection, in our museum that we have in Little Rock that is actually it was, was found after Cabrera passed away just a few years ago. The burial cloths show the dinosaur motifs. Uh, that, that says they were seeing dinosaurs. The pottery shows what certainly appear to be dinosaurs on them. 
This is a picture I took in the National Museum in Lima, uh, 2,500 years according to the date in the museum. I think I know what that looks like. And they were dating that. They had death masks from the northern part of Peru with, made of gold. Uh, notice the tail coming up over the back and the teeth on the creatures on either side. I think from the burial stones and from the burial cloths, the pottery, and the death mask, it was obvious they were seeing dinosaurs. They were impressed by them, and somehow they were incorporating that into their burial ceremony. Definitely turvy fossils. From Peru, let's go to Mexico, right in the middle, central Mexico in the Combro in the upper highlands. We made a number of trips there, at least six, with Dr. Swift, who uh, is uh, an archaeologist. Lots of strange creatures found in the Chipicoro culture there in Acombro that's dated 4,000 years ago by several different methods. Uh, there are over 2,000 dinosaurs and almost 30,000 figurines that they have now in a museum to display this Chipicoro culture. Uh, what does that look like to you? <laughs> they were seeing that 4,000 years ago, and they knew that this, they were able to stand up. We didn't know that till Spielberg taught us that with Jurassic Park, uh, but they knew that 4,000 years ago. Uh, this is an iguanodon. The early pictures of iguanodon show kind of standing up a little bit, but his tail is always dragging. Uh, with what we've learned recently, the picture here on the upper left shows that tail sticking straight out. It has, uh, well, the structure is somewhat like a bird's tail. If it's dragging the ground, it's broken. Uh, we didn't know that for almost 100 years. Uh, we know it now, but they knew it 4,000 years ago when they were depicting the iguanodon. Uh, so again and again, we see, no, not 100 million years apart. They don't have to be both in the same picture, but if they are, that just kind of strengthens it. But I think I know what that looks like. And that's what they were doing, different artists, different styles. Uh, of dinosaurs. This is my wife's favorite. Uh, but obviously, the implication is they're not 100 million years apart, as the geologic column says they're supposed to be. Now, we travel to France. Uh, my wife's not going to go down to central Mexico or Peru. Will we fly into Paris? Yep, she's ready to go. <laughs> Here we are in Paris at the Louvre, and dragons, which look like dinosaurs, all the way through dozens of places. Here is Sir George slaying the dragon. What does he look like? He looks a lot like a T-Rex, isn't he? And many of them do. The, the word, well, I think we'll get to that in a minute. The word dinosaur wasn't invented till long after the King James was translated. It was referred to as a dragon in dozens of places throughout the King James and in most Bibles today. But they were representing Sir George as slaying, what does that look like? Uh, called a dragon in the center of Tbilisi, European Georgia. You see this um, Monument about 60 feet up in the air. You see a, a gold Sir George slaying the dragon. We were there not long ago, and there he is up top killing a dinosaur, which is what Georgia is about. Georgia got his name from Sir George that slew the dragon. It's about killing dinosaurs. Did you know that? And that's where Georgia today, this is the new Georgia in the U.S. It, it's about killing dinosaurs, which 
was a real story recorded in history. Sir George was killed as a crusader in Israel. I can show you the tomb. I've been there. Uh, here is the, the the flag or in the representation of Sir George slaying the dragon, the national symbol of Tbilisi, and about half a dozen different countries in Europe. The crusader flag is seen in the left. That's the flag of Tbilisi that represents Sir George, the crusader here, BBC News says 10 uh, things you might, we won't go through 10 things, but two, no mistaking the link to Sir St. George, the golden statue of him slaying a dragon is in Tbilisi Central Square. George's patron saint on the national flag. And uh, it's not a question over there. They see representations of Sir George and the dragon. In China, we have this. Uh, in fact, this is a picture of one of the turquoise dragons that we have in a display out in the foyer. It's supposed to be 4,000 years old, according to Stanford scientists who dated it. Um, it's like a dinosaur. We travel to France. Uh, again, my Beloved is standing out in her backyard. <laughs> she wishes. Uh, this is a Chateau de Chambord, built in the 12 to 1300s. It has over 700 dinosaurs carved on the walls of this dinosaur. Uh, that is this castle. There's some of them that you can see here. Uh, Standing here by one of them, it does look like he's breathing fire. Uh, that's an interesting question. Maybe figurative language, but it uh, is depicted here. Uh, the claws, the scales are obvious, and uh, they're all over the ceiling and the walls, uh, staircases beside this beautiful young lady and uh, all over the ceiling. If you travel not too far from there, well, we'll look at the example here of one of the ceiling tiles that we do have replica of out in the foyer. Uh, and compare that with Plateosaurus from the Harvard Museum of Natural History. <laughs> it looks the same to me. We're used to seeing T-Rex. They weren't all T-Rexes. They were a variety, maybe 50 different types. Plateosaurus sure looks a lot like what we see all over the castle walls. This is over the fireplace. Uh, Chateau de Bois, about 20 kilometers away, has the same thing all over it. This was the symbol of the king at the time. Uh, you're going to pick an animal symbol to... Show a ferocious, powerful king. A dinosaur would do a pretty good job. Would his wife also had a symbol? It was the porcupine. <laughs> sure, what that means. <laughs> um, that's what it was. In the throne room, you see a tapestry, Flemish tapestry from the 1100s, and looking closely, you see dragon, dinosaur. It looks a lot like the Plateosaurus, or at least maybe like Dracorex hagwashia, uh, named after Harry Potter's dinosaur. Uh, Tom Barker from Harvard was the discoverer. But that's what you see in France uh, in more than the places we see here. This will just give you some examples. Leonardo da Vinci drew this. In the 1500s, in the 1500s, we didn't know what dinosaurs looked like. What does that look like to you? That's his picture that's in the Vatican. Now, this is not a picture that uh, Marco Polo drew, but we have him superimposed on a picture. But notice Marco Polo's description of what he did see. Huge serpents, uh, 10 paces in length, that would be 50 feet, uh, to four part near the head, 
uh, two small short legs uh, which have three claws um, the jaws wide enough to swallow a man teeth large and sharp their whole appearance so formidable that neither man nor any kind of animal uh, can march and come in without terror this that sure sounds like a T-Rex, doesn't it? With the small arms and the three claws. We traveled to Cambodia. The tour guide who had seen some of the videos on TV write me and send me a little sketch. Three months and about $10,000 later, we found out what he was talking about. We went to Cambodia. Uh, the Khmer Empire has built lots of temples and J. Yavardaman the seventh is one of the great temple builders uh, of, uh, this, this was dated from 1181 and he's here posed like Buddha uh, didn't quite worship him but very close the prom was one of the temples that was uh, not restored still out in the jungle up near Siem Reap, and in this temple, the tour guide had seen something that he thought might be interesting in view of what he'd seen me talking about on the, on the video. Uh, this was dedicated in 1186, but you see carvings on the stone walls all the way through these temples, and right where that red arrow is pointing in the temple, you see this column with lots of jungle animals carved on it and what does that look like to you uh, it's a perfect replica of a stegosaurus uh, which would clearly indicate a man had to do that and proof along with the dozens of things, other examples you've seen, that they're not 100 million years apart, which test that hypothesis. Uh, what does that mean? Well, let's just look at what some of the evolutionists tell us this means. Here's Arthur Strasher, who wrote the book against the creationists and how terrible and dumb they are. But the significance of the coexistence for humans and dinosaurs is a topic number of them talk about. He says uh, humans and dinosaurs uh, lived at the same, if they lived at the same time, such a finding would counter, it would be a crushing blow. Uh, the hypothesis of evolution would be falsified. Humans and dinosaurs together, that just rips it. Uh, Jacob, uh, Lewis Jacobs was at SMU, he was head of uh, the American uh, Society for Geologists at the time this statement was made, and he plainly says that evolution would be utterly destroyed if you found the two together. Stephen Stanley, that we quoted from earlier, said would disprove evolution. Uh, Jerry Cohn from the University of Chicago, a, a vicious anti-creationist, says it would... Uh, destroy Darwinism, and uh, you find Richard Dawkins making a number of statements, evolution would be utterly destroyed. Uh, he says it, it would just demolish evolution, and so that's what it means. If we have demonstrated that, they tell us the implication of that. The test comes by, or here's the way they say it ought to look, and when you see the contradictions that we've shown, um, then we see a test of the hypothesis, and it doesn't work. I think, as we suggested, it is an adequate and uh, useful model to test. Let's see if it lines up. If you get it out of order, that is a test of the hypothesis, and all of this evidence is an example of the fact it doesn't work. It absolutely destroys the model of evolution in the geologic column. I think we see the significance emphasized especially by NOVA, 
who heard about the footprints at Glen Rose. They came down to make a movie. They were all excited about the footprints. The editor killed it, uh, replaced it with an article about an ex expose of Jimmy Swaggart. <laughs> had nothing to do with any evidence, but they said in a brief presentation video on the footprints uh, that included the footprints that there were n is nothing at Glen Rose that looks anything like a human footprint. Definitely not. And why? Uh, dinosaur footprints side by side with humans, they said, and we've shown examples of that, would counter evidence that humans evolved long after the dinosaurs became extinct and back up the claim that all species, including man, were created at one time. Nova knew what it meant. And so they said, it ain't so. Well, you'll just have to decide for yourself whether it's so. I think there's powerful evidence that it is. And this is what it means, according to the evolutionists. I think we have abundant evidence that God created this world. He did it in six days. All of the critters that we've been talking about tonight, most of them would be on the sixth day. And so if we find them together, what, that's what we expect. They shouldn't be 100 million years apart. Um, 100 million years is another subject, but um, certainly it refutes what you're taught in the textbook. We have evidence for exactly what Nova says, all created at one time. You'll stand before that creator one day and give an account for your faith, or lack thereof. And what will you say? Didn't know? Well, I think you know now. And we'd encourage you to come confessing your faith and repenting your sins, which is what God requires. Be baptized into Christ, and you can live with him forever. The Creator has promised, and what he says is dependable. If you're subject to his invitation, we want to 